And that means his elements of his division get stretched out very thinly. Um, the Marines, on the other hand, a little bit south and a little bit west of them, uh, led by a general named Smith, they're taking their time. They are making sure that they've got the supports behind them that they need. Uh, one of the things that Smith does is he builds a runway, so if we need to get air support, we can get it, and, and he's taking his time a little bit. Um, the key feature to all the fighting in the Chosen Reservoir is the bitter cold. Um, time and time again, you hear it described as a frozen hell. 20, 25 degrees below zero, 30, 40 mile an hour winds. Um, it is so cold that there are men who are shot who should probably bleed to death, but they don't because their blood freezes. One of the main problems they all have is that their, their, their food, their sea rations, they're these little tin cans. And the opener for that is that, right there. It's a P-38 can opener, it's nothing special. It's a very simple little device. I picked this one up at Fort Sill, Oklahoma in 1984. I've uh, been carrying it ever since. But these things are so, it's so cold that the steel on these P-38s is snapping. They can't open their food. So they're taking bayonets, trench knives, the axes off their trucks. They're trying to open up their rations. And even if they can open up, you don't have time, you don't have the, 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 the opportunity to heat this stuff. So you're eating frozen stew sickles. Um, to add, to make the, the, the problem worse, this gun right here, 57 millimeter uh, uh, recoilless rifle, it's a big bazooka on a tripod, but you see this, this fat end in the back of the breech here, that's where you load the ammunition in. And the Marines irreverently refer to the ammunition as Tootsie Rolls. So they're running out of ammunition, they call back to the rear, they need more Tootsie Rolls. And some supply sergeant takes them at their word, and I don't know if you can see that little box right there, but they get cases of Tootsie Roll. <laughs> so, one of the good things about Tootsie Roll, at least, you can unwrap it and you can pop it in your mouth and you can get a little bit of nutrient, you get a little bit of sugar, you get something. Uh, these conditions are so horrific that the, the medics, the, the corpsmen, the Navy corpsmen with these guys, their supplies are freezing. There are stories of, of, of corpsmen having to use Tootsie Rolls to pack wounds with. Um, it's so cold that these corpsmen are taking the, the morphine surrettes, the little individual shots of morphine, and they'll put it in their mouth and they'll kind of warm it up a little bit so they can give that morphine to a wounded man, but they got to they gotta thaw it first. The other thing about these Tootsie Rolls is in these conditions, these trucks are starting to spring leaks. Radiators are cracking, uh, you're getting ho holes in your hoses, but you can take a Tootsie Roll and you kind of, with, the, with your own body heat, you can kind of shape it, you can make it a little bit malleable, and you can repair things on your trucks. Uh, these guys adapt and overcome. That's what they did, adapt and overcome. Um, so the Marines are surrounded, like I said, uh, up to, and they're outnumbered by up to 10 to one. And the commander says, I'm surrounded. I can attack in whatever direction I want. So they turn south and they attack to the south. And when General Smith is, is asked about this, he says, retreat hell, we're just attacking in the other direction. And I just love that. I, that, that, is, so, that is so Marine Corps, I like that. But, the, but what these guys put up with, what they dealt with uh, through, through skill, through determination, through discipline, through just pure superhuman will, this ranks up there with anything the United States Marine Corps has ever done. This is right up there with Iwo Jima. And every Marine I've ever met knows about uh, Chosen Reservoir. Almost none of the rest of us do. But uh, the Marines maintain their heritage very, very well. All right, let's come this way a little bit. Commanding officer stands in this, this cupola here, and it looks like a priest's pulpit. So they call it a priest. This gun we've got set up, and it's a self-propelled howitzer, uh, but it's set up, the, the numbers on it we have are 300th Armored Field Artillery. Um, these guys are, they call themselves the Cowboy Cannoneers because they're a National Guard unit from Wyoming. Uh, one of the batteries <coughs> was just down the street in Lander. And one of the things I love to point out is 
this photograph right here, two photographs right here. As the cowboy cannoneers are leaving the state of Wyoming, they start stealing signs off the road. So there is entering Wyoming signs here. And finally, uh, the transportation department says, just stop stealing our signs. We'll give you signs. Don't make us go out and put new signs up. And it is, it is, it's a, it's a, a, a tradition today that when a Wyoming National Guard unit deploys overseas, YDOT has a, 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 a ceremony and they present the unit commander with their own entering Wyoming sign. And they still do that today. And I just think that's awesome. I love it. I love it. All right. There's some signs here. Okay. Outstanding. Outstanding. So you kept those big guns shooting? Get those big guns shooting. That's outstanding. Thank you very much. One of the Cowboy Canyoneers. Um, if you guys, if you guys would, if you guys would make these folks a little bit of room, let them get by. That's well, that. We're, we're coming oh, here to see this place play. Okay, <laughs> I'm glad you are. I'm glad you are. Our main goal. Um. So, I said earlier on in the war, we have uh, uh, those 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 big Russian tanks, those big T-34s. Oh. Any of the ammunition we had, we just kind of bounce off. So eventually, we get bigger guns, bigger tanks, and these things will stop those T-34s, no problem. But I don't want to talk about them. I want to talk about this horse right here. Uh, Reckless. She is the Marines. Buy her uh, from a sold racetrack. They, 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 they're authorized to spend $200, but the boy who's selling her, his sister, walked into a minefield and she lost a leg and he wants to buy her a prosthetic leg and he wants 250 for the horse. So the Marines actually pass the hat this guy is and um, uh, they buy the horse at his, his rate. Yes, sir. Now they are lost. Where is the front dash? Uh, 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 Andrew. Alright, so they have this horse and they're using her as a pack animal because in Korea uh, uh, with this steep terrain You've got to have pack animals. I mean, we were using pack animals in Afghanistan. Uh, but her job is to haul a couple of crates, not on, like, like those right there, of, of this recoilless ammunition, Tootsie Rolls, uh, and going to take them up the hill. The horse very quickly becomes a favorite of the men. Uh, on a cold night, they will find her in a tent, staying warm. Uh, the, the horse learns as artillery shells are coming, whatever, the, if the Marines take cover, she will lay down and take cover too. The Marines love this horse. She uh, she eats their food, she drinks their beer, she eats thirty dollars worth of poker chips, and they don't mind. <laughs> they love this horse. So where she actually earns her stripes, literally, is um, at the, it's, it's it's a fight for it's called Outpost Vegas. So they can bring ammunition into this 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 road, but they can't get the ammunition up to the ridge line where the fight's actually taking place at. So they load the ammunition on these pack horses. And they go up the hill, they drop it off, they come down, they load up, they go back up. And at one point, Reckless is, her handler gets uh, gets lost. He's, he's wounded, and they don't know where he is, but the horse knows where she's been. So she goes to the ammo dump, she stops, they load her up. She goes to the top of the hill, they unload. She goes to the bottom, and they finally figure out that there is no, no handler at all, but the horse is doing what she needs to do. So just let her go. She makes 51 trips up and down this hill. She's wounded twice. Um, she keeps doing her job. At some point, there are wounded men up at the top of the ridge, and she is hauling them down so they can get them. She, she gets into an ambulance. They love this horse. At the end of the war, the Marines decide um, they want to take this horse home, which is against US military policy. At the end of a war, these service animals all get left wherever they're at, and very often they're destroyed. Uh, I know a guy who spent two tours in Vietnam, two extra tours in Vietnam, he was a dog handler, he didn't want to leave that dog. And finally it was too much and he had to go home. But uh, the Marines, yeah, we want to get this horse back home with us. And the Navy's not going to put some stinky animal on their ship, it's against regulations, but there is uh, a shipping line owner, and he says, I'll get your horse on one of my boats and I'll get her home for you. And they bring her back to San Francisco, and she uh, retires to Camp Pendleton, Florida. Um, they put her in a great big pasture. She's right across the street from the, 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 the main church, the Camp Pendleton Church. And every Sunday there's a traffic jam. 
because everybody wants to stop and they want to love on reckless. Now she's promoted to corporal during that, that, that outpost Vega thing. By the time she gets back to the States, they, they promote her to sergeant. So they want to see sergeant reckless. And they feed her sugar cubes and apples and they love on her. And if you don't feed this horse and love on her, she's like right here, it's like, why aren't you bluffing on me? Uh, she's got character. Uh, she dies in 1968. By this point, she has birthed uh, uh, three Colts and a filly, um, and she's promoted to the rank of staff sergeant. And she officially has all these medals and ribs. She's got Purple Heart. She's got unit citations. She's got the French Forger. She's got all of this stuff. Um, um, she dies in 1968, and she is buried with full military honors. And my understanding is that no other military, no other horse in the United States history, except for Phil Sheridan's horse Rienzi given full military honor. And I think that's pretty cool. But the absolute cherry on top of this story is every single Marine who graduates boot camp from 1953 to 1968 is outranked by a horse. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. All right, I want you to get real. Three year period, 5.7. Vietnam, 20 year period, 3.4 million. Substantially fewer Americans served in Vietnam than in Korea, and we've forgotten about it. Korea is absolutely the forgotten war. This bottom left number here, almost 34,000 Americans are killed in action in Korea in three years. Vietnam, 20, not quite 41,000. This is a big deal. Korea is a nasty start to finish knife fight. And we have forgotten about Korea other than episodes of MASH which, hey, like I said, I love MASH as much as the next guy. That ain't Korea. That is not what we've been talking about in here. Now, the other thing about Korea is, is this is going to inform how we fight. And Korea shares the border with China. And look at that. Chinese soldiers come crashing through. Millions of Americans die. Millions of Americans are killed. Because of the Chinese soldiers coming through the border. Now, the fire bases and towns and whatnot. But I, I, I have a hard time using this map to talk about the war because you don't have a nice, simple line to follow the ebb and flow of. What we've got in Vietnam is, I, I, I kind of hate this analogy, but Cavalry's a hill with three crosses on it. <laughs> Cavalry is a guy on a horse, a guy in a helicopter, a guy in a tank. So if you want to move the Sorry. Close air support, you can uh, uh, use it for, for locating the enemy, all kinds of things. One of the most important missions the helicopters have in Vietnam is Pentagon. Air and they call the dust off. If a dust off can pick up a guy, a wounded soldier, a wounded marine, a wounded airman, if you can get a guy out of the mud, off the battlefield, and into a hospital within an hour, in 60 minutes, Die in Vietnam. 
Uh, again, there is no safe place anywhere in South Vietnam. Now, the majority of these eight who were killed die in, in, in accidents and, and, and plane crashes and things like that. But even still, uh, there is no safe place. If you look at this photograph right here, these three women, they're Navy nurses, and they're being awarded Purple Hearts because the base they were at came under attack by enemy rocket fire. Uh, now, the civilian women who were over there, uh, they serve a number of functions. So very often they are Red Cross nurses. Uh, very often they are USO uh, donut dollars. Uh, they go to the USO camps and they will uh, chat with the guys, uh, give them uh, soft drinks and, and, and cookies and donuts and that kind of thing, and just generally try to help raise their morale. You got photojournalists, you got uh, uh, people doing basically like, like uh, uh, Peace Corps type things. You've got administrators, you've got women all over the place. Uh, of the civilian women who, who go to Vietnam, uh, there are 59 of them who died. Uh, one of them was, as I said, that, that, that journalist Marguerite Higgins, she contracts some kind of a, a jungle virus and uh, they ship her home, but they're still not, we're still not able to, to save her life. Uh, you've got ladies working with the USO, with, with Bob Hope and doing things like that. There's a picture of, I've decided she's my girlfriend, even though she might be close to 90 now, I don't know how you describe that one. Um, uh, but Chris Noel, she goes there, she serves eight tours, touring around Vietnam. She's uh, a DJ for Radio America, uh, and she's just outstanding. And I'll point out the picture when she comes up, but she's wearing a, a sweater in Vietnam. It's 102 degrees, it's gotta be at 98% humidity, and this chick's wearing a sweater. She's tougher than me. Absolutely, she's tougher than me. And the other thing I wanna say about the, 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 the women who serve is we know how difficult the men have it getting their benefits, getting taken care of by the VA and other organizations, and the women have it five times worse. Uh, uh, it's, it, it, the whole system is set up to help the men. It's not at all set up to help the women. And the women who are returning from Vietnam just have a bear of a time trying to get uh, 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 the care that they need. All right, let's come around the corner. I might not get it. You're coming along, you're in your little convoy, and there's a good chance you're going to get ambushed. So our guys come up with the idea of this right here. It's, a, it's called a gun truck. You take just any old deuce and a half, and you start plastering quarter-inch steel plates on there, and you put every machine gun you can possibly find. Uh, I was talking to a guy who was a, a quad 50 gunner. And he said, you don't want to have, or if you have your gun turned kind of perpendicular to the truck, you have to shoot very short bursts because otherwise it feels like you're going to tip your truck over if you're, if you're not paying attention. Now, my favorite story about these convoys is there's this guy over here we talked about. His name is Paul Hubbard. Uh, Paul is a ranch kid from a little bitty town of Lusk, Wyoming, on the eastern side of the state. Uh, I know it very well because I very carefully had to watch my speed limit every time I came through, or my speed, because if you're going a mile over the uh, the, the, the county sheriffs, they're gonna they're gonna grab you. Um, but Paul comes over and he's a truck driver, and he's in this convoy, and the convoy gets attacked, and they stop and they fight off the attack. Um, they're successful. When Paul gets back to his truck, his uh, brakes have been shot out. But he jumps in his truck. He delivers his supplies, he delivers his load to this fire base that he's going to. And I'm talking to him and I'm saying, Paul, man, your truck is broke. It's, if it's me, I'm, 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 I'm sitting in a ditch waiting for some mechanic to fix my brakes. And he said, they needed to get their stuff. And I said, what were you hauling? He said, I don't know. It was a refrigerated truck. And I said, so you don't know if it was Budweiser or penicillin? He said, I didn't know. I didn't ask. I didn't care. I, I, I took this stuff to these guys. They needed it. And I got it to them with no brakes. And that, what I love about this story is here's just, just some nothing special schmuck spec four, uh, this junior NCO, but he's been given a job to do and he's going to do it the best he can with what he's got. Uh, you're not going to make any war movie starring Brad Pitt about this guy anytime in the future, um, but he's just doing his job. And that's, that is just the story of so, so, so many service members in Vietnam. They're just doing their job the best they can under really lousy circumstances. Time.
Uh, there were other kinds of tiger stripes and just various things. But typically what you see your soldiers wearing is this, these, these jungle fatigues right here. We were still issued jungle fatigues in the 1980s, and I loved mine. They're lightweight, they breathe, they dry fairly quickly. Uh, they're rip stops, so when you catch some kind of a wait a minute thorn, it's not gonna rip your whole sleeve off. Um, I love the, 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 the pockets in there. They're at an angle so you can reach in and you can grab that stuff as you need. But more importantly, these jungle boots that, that he's wearing, uh, you've got this, this nylon, what today we would call Cordura, but it's just this web nylon, and it's lighter, it dries quicker. Um, when you step in a big puddle, when you step in a rice paddy or whatever, your boot is now full of water, and down at the bottom of the instep of these boots is, uh, there's a couple of little buttons, smaller than a dime, that uh, have a bunch of little holes in it. So every time you take a step, the water kind of squirches its way. That's a technical term, squirch. You, le you learn that in, in military, yeah. Uh, the water the water kind of squishes out of the bottom of your boot, and it helps you from keeping from getting dry rot or, or excuse me, jungle rot or whatever. The other thing about these boots is on the sole of them, there's a special pattern that just by design allows the mud to, to, to fall out of your boot more quickly. Um, but also, there is initially, it's a stainless steel plate that's in the sole of the boot. So if you're walking along and you step on punji stakes like these right here, instead of nailing your foot to the ground, that's gonna protect the bottom of your foot a little bit. Um, and I, yeah, I love my jungle uniform, I love my jungle boots. And I could wear them when I was stationed in Kentucky, but when I shifted to Hawaii, they took my jungle uniform away from me. That made me very sad. In fact, let's cut this. Beetle next to him. Don't know why, but he moons her. 
Come to find out, she is on the Fremont County Draft Board. Uh, yeah, you guys are already ahead of me on this one. Uh, by that next Friday, they get their, their, their draft notifications in the mail. They go down to Denver, they have their physicals taken. Dunk's brother was injured. He was in a, he was in a, a car accident. He's got a bad back, so he can't go. But Dunk is fine. He is a fine physical specimen. He, he just knows for a fact he's going to get drafted. He doesn't want to be a hole digger. So he thinks, I'm going to join the Navy. I'm going to join the Navy. I'm going to be an aircraft carrier. And I'm going to be 30 miles out to sea. I'm not even going to smell Vietnam. The problem is, he's an engine guy. He's a car guy. This thing has two big old Detroit motors in it. And he foolishly lets that be known somewhere. Uh, and he spends the next year of his life on the, on the, the Mekong River. All right, let's come up around the corner here. I got some benches up here. Uh, I'm just going to kind of, like I say, I'm going to give you my closing thoughts. Um, of course, as I said, Dan creates this museum. He buys a tank and put it in a parade. The tank doesn't work, so he buys a second tank, and it blossoms into this. It, Dan's uh, number one priority is to, he wants to honor the service and sacrifice of uh, the service members, but their families as well. Uh, but Dan wants to honor the service and sacrifice of these guys. So in our mission statement, number one is honor, number two is educate, and then number three is preserve some of these vehicles. So we know, as far as honoring these guys go, that when they came back, the men and women very often, they, they did not receive the best reception. Very often these guys had dog crap thrown at them. Very often they had uh, uh, insults thrown at them that were worse than that. Um, and we think about these stories, typically the, the, the one, the guy, the, the protester that you in your mind's eye is somebody with long hair kind of like mine, with the round glasses, the John Lennon glasses kind of like mine, and that's not always the case. It's not always the guy with the love beads, the hippie with the bell bottoms. This, this, this disrespect for these service members coming back is nationwide. So Dan tells a story about, there's a Casper guy, a Casper veteran, who's coming home and the Star Tribune prints in the paper when he's arriving in his flight number. And he's, of course, met at the gate by protesters. Now, on the flight over, he kind of buddies up with another guy in uniform. So as they get off the plane, these protesters are kind of pushing them, shoving them, calling them names. And these two vets are ready to defend themselves. They're ready to fight back. And a Larimer County Sheriff's deputy comes up, sees what's going on, and says, you two boys go in that bathroom right now, change out of your uniforms, or I'm going to arrest you for disturbing the peace. A law enforcement officer knows for a fact that these two guys did nothing wrong. He knows for a fact that they did nothing wrong. But he's going to arrest them. This is nationwide. The VFW Club, Veterans of Foreign Wars, I've got absolutely nothing but the greatest respect and admiration for this organization, but they were late getting into the game. It was 1972 before they would allow Vietnam veterans to join their organization at, a, at, at the top level. Now, there are individual local units that, brother, you fight, I want you to have a beer with me. In fact, I'm going to buy you the first beer. But at the, the, the leadership level, they did not welcome Vietnam vets losers. This isn't a real war. It doesn't count. It was never declared a war. You don't count. And these are the guys, these men who are coming back, these are their fathers, these are their, their, their uncles, and they were not accepted either. It's not just the hippies. It was everybody. So now what we're trying to do is, since about 1990, we're trying to, to kind of atone for some of these earlier sins. And, and we're, we're doing a better job of, of, of supporting our guys and our women. So this is Dan's, like I said, this is Dan's dream. This is what Dan wants to do with all of this. Now me personally, the way I like to tell the story is I don't care about Westmoreland. I don't care about Patton. I don't care about these big guys. I like that worm's eye view. 
I like the individual schmuck down in a down in the muck, uh, 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 a soldier, a marine, an airman, uh, a sailor. These, these little guys who are just trying to do their job the best they can in a bad, bad situation. And I don't care if you were drafted. I don't care if you volunteered, man or woman. I don't care. This is the end of Everybody my videotape tour. To the best they could with what they if have. you ever get a chance so to go to the National Museum of Military all, Vehicles in uh, Dubois, so Wyoming, it's kind of about a four-hour tour, with, and it is so guys, very informative and interesting. Thank you very much. For Thank you very much.